Now, one of the first and intriguing areas to, that I dealt with and discovered more or less accidentally was the Cotton's contribution to the Marshall Plan. Now, all good graduate and undergraduate students know that George Kennan had an awful lot to do with the development of the Marshall Plan, and that's true, he did. I'm not trying to deny that. And that a lot of Northeastern intellectuals and advisors in the, in the State Department had a lot to do with that as well. We know about the contributions of Will Clayton, who was head of Anderson Clayton Company, of course. Uh, he was Under Secretary for, uh, of State for Economic Affairs. He had an awful, awful lot to do with the coming of and development of the Marshall Plan. And I'm sure most of you know what the Marshall Plan is. It started in, uh, it was announced in June 1947 by Secretary of State George Marshall. And it became that massive plan by which the United States tried to rebuild Europe. And it's been regarded as a great success story. And uh, I saw something in one of the papers we read the other day how the Middle East needs a, a Marshall Plan. And every now and then you'll hear something about, we need a Marshall Plan here. We need a Marshall Plan there. It's sort of become part of our, our culture to solve everything with a Marshall Plan. But I somehow just felt that the cotton industry had something to do with this. And as I talked to people at the Cotton Council, there was a feeling among them that there was something there, and they had never been able to pin it down. Never had anyone been able to, to figure this, this out, this role of cotton. So I took it upon myself to do it to the best that it could be done. And I worked, and I worked, and I worked. And when I was tired of working, I worked some more. And so I continued to pursue it. And uh, we know the Germans surrendered May the 8th, 1945. In May 1945, before that month was over, an agent of Anderson Clayton, who was in Italy, sent uh, uh, dispatches to the office headquarters in Houston, uh, uh, Anderson Clayton headquarters in Houston, that cotton, raw cotton, should be sent to Italy ASAP. Uh, to keep the textile workers there occupied in the northern half of Italy where the Italian uh, textile industry was concentrated. And there were thousands of P Italians who worked in the textile industry. He said, this agent said, get some raw cotton over here and put these people to work because communist agents are already starting to move in and try to exploit their, uh, their unemployment and their low living standards and, and the disruptions of the war. If we can get some cotton in their hands, this would help, help Italy and help, help, help Europe. And that, 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 that evidence came as early as May 1945. Uh, <clears throat> I went to the National Archives, and in June 1945, I discovered there, this is very early in the history of the Marshall Plan, because it was not announced until June 1947. In June 1945, the USDA became aware of Soviet intrusion into the cotton market in Hungary, a market that had been supplied by U.S. growers prior to World War II, some 300,000 bales approximately each year. And then in July 45, a three-man party from the American Cotton Shippers Association went to Europe to try to restore the market there. Uh, and then later, Robert Jackson, who worked for the Cotton Council for some years, known as the first cotton man in Europe, went there. And he went through uh, the markets and contacted some of the old pre-World War II cotton buyers and shippers there. Uh, and brokers, and uh, Bob Jackson sent back these lengthy reports. And uh, in his uh, interview, his oral interview, Bob Jackson talked about, and, he, and I interviewed him a couple of afternoons before he died, I was able to talk to him. He talked about this. He sent back these lengthy, detailed reports on the conditions that he saw there. And he described not only the, the conditions uh, of the cotton industry and the textile, uh, of the cotton textile industry there, because of course they didn't grow cotton there, uh, but, but, but how people were starving, how people were scrounging through the woods to find food, how their diets were not substantial, and he was sending these reports that went directly to the Cotton Council. And then they also went to uh, 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 Anderson Clayton. Now, Anderson Clayton at that time was headed by a man named Lamar Fleming, a much overlooked man in American cotton history. We hear about Will Clayton, we hear about Oscar Johnston, we don't hear enough about Lamar Fleming. He took the job after Will Clayton went to the State Department uh, as head of Anderson Clayton. And so Lamar Fleming was getting this, and if there was anybody, there's only one person, best I can find, who corresponded with Will Clayton over cotton, and that was Lamar Fleming. 
Uh, and so these reports that started with Bob Jackson, these detailed reports, came to Memphis, went to Houston, went from Houston up to the State Department. So all along, as these reports came in, the State Department had access to them as early as the summer of 1945, you see.